Now, today we're going to look at um, a passage of scripture that um, intersects with our lives again and again and again, whether we want it to or not. James chapter 1, beginning at verse 12, reading to verse 25. James 1, 12 to 25. The thing is that if we are concerned about Christian living, if we are concerned about growth in sanctification, then at some point we have to think about how we face trials and temptations. All of us face trials and temptations, and how we handle them is really in lockstep with how we grow or do not grow in sanctification. And this passage focuses on trials and temptations. I could begin at verse 2. I'm going to refer back to those earlier verses in a few moments. But at the moment, I think I'll begin with verse 12. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because, having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. When tempted... No one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, because Human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. This is the word of the Lord. I know an English chap who, quite a number of decades ago, felt called to Christian ministry. He attended a theological training institution in England and, in due course, graduated and became pastor of a church in that country. He was a gifted communicator. He was pretty bold, good mind, pastoral... uh, activist in many ways, Um, and the church began to grow, flourished. Sadly, after about three or four years, he was caught out in adultery. He resigned, of course, disappeared from the scene. I didn't know him at that stage. I met him in Canada without knowing anything of this background. He was attending in the late 1960s, a seminary that I then attended. We didn't know of his background, but we were in some of the same classes and graduated about the same time. And um, I went off to the west coast of Canada, and he disappeared into the wilds of Ontario. Uh, He became pastor of a church there. And uh, I heard through the perennial ecclesiastical grapevine that uh, things were going pretty well. And uh, then after some years, I was in Europe, and I heard through the grapevine that he had got caught, caught, got caught out in adultery and uh, was forced to resign. More years went back. Um, eventually, I moved back to Vancouver. And some years after that, 
um, in the Lord's peculiar providence, I moved south of the 49th parallel and became a missionary to the United States. <laughs> I arrived in Chicago and uh, began teaching at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. And when I got there, I didn't know any of the churches in the area. Uh, all my life had been in Canada or in Europe. And, and so I was still poking around, finding out how ecclesiastical structures are put together in this country. And um, the seminary administration asked if I would mind filling in on an interim basis, part-time, at a nearby church. It turned out that this church had, had recently gone through a, 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 a serious dislocation. It, it had had a, a pastor who had been quite effective. The church was growing, people were converted, uh, things were flourishing, and then lo and behold, he, he, this minister had got caught out in adultery. You guessed it, your friend and mine, the same chap. Now, why do I tell you this story? It's not very edifying. I could say quite a lot about the foolishness and irresponsibility of churches and not doing some elementary background checks. But that's not my point. If you talk to this fellow after this event, I haven't communicated with him now for many, many years. But the last time that there was any sort of connection whatsoever, he had moved to Ohio where he was selling computer components. And if you asked him then, you know, what went wrong? I mean, one time was horrible, but three times? The, the damage you've done, what, what, what went wrong? His answer would be, God says that there is no temptation taken you but what is common to men. But he would provide a way of escape so that you may be able to bear it. I couldn't bear it. So that proves God is a liar. And that's all he would say. Oh, he was pretty blunt, all right, but are there not some times when we're pushing pretty hard on the temptation front or the trial front and we really feel we can't take anymore? Now, that's uh, my first Englishman story. But lest we malign all Englishmen, let me tell you another Englishman story and then we'll plunge into the text. This man, this man, I'll give him a name. His name is Norman Anderson. Long now since gone to glory. He went to Cambridge University, which was my old stomping grounds, in the 1930s, which was long before I was stomping anywhere. <laughs> and there he met his wife. Uh, he was active in KQ, Cambridge Intercollegiate Christian Union, their version of InterVarsity. And... Um, eventually went as a missionary in the 1930s to Egypt, where he learned Arab, Arabic fluently and so on, served well there. At the outbreak of World War II, he was eventually conscripted into counterintelligence, partly because he knew the language. After World War I, they moved back, after World War II, they moved back to, to, to Britain, where he did more studies and eventually became the director of the Oriental Institute of London University, and for his academic and institutional services, was eventually knighted by the Queen. And so he became Sir Norman Anderson. And all during these years, decades on, he, he, he was an active layman in the Church of England, a very gifted preacher. And in addition to writing all kinds of technical works about Islam and Arabic and so on, he, 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 uh, he also wrote Christian books from a lay point of view, Christianity and World Religions, still worth reading to this day, Norman Anderson, and um, wrote evangelistic books and spoke at uh, student um, missions and, and, and that sort of thing. He, he was a really a remarkable man. He had three kids. The first one became a medical missionary to what was then the Belgian Congo in the great violence of the Belgian Congo when it was throwing off the Belgian overlord and um, was becoming Zaire, 
uh, this daughter, who was a medical missionary, was gang raped. She was furloughed home and was recovering, went to California to do some advanced study in medicine before going back to Congo. Uh, but while she was in California, she tripped, fell down some stairs, and drowned in her own spittle. The second daughter died in circumstances scarcely less bizarre. The third child was a son, born rather later in life. His name was Hugh. He died of a brain tumor in his third year as an undergraduate at Cambridge University. He was so bright and was moving in all the right circles that he was already being touted as a potential future Prime Minister of England. But he died. He died just a few months before I moved to England for the first time in 1972. That's when I first met Sir Orman. Over the years, Norman and his wife became very close friends. And late in life, by which time his wife was suffering from advanced Alzheimer's, he was asked to give his testimony at a large meeting of students, about 2,000 students. He couldn't trust his memory anymore, and he didn't have the energy to write it all up. So they asked him if he would just answer some questions. So one of the chaps asked him a whole lot of questions about his life, and he answered. 2,000 students sat, sat spellbound. And in all the years that I knew him until he died, and in that testimony, I never, ever heard one single word of bitterness. Not one. Not one. What's the difference between my two Englishmen? And that's what this passage is about. We are all going to face trials and temptations. We are going to face them. If you live long enough, you'll get kicked in the teeth. You'll be bereaved. You lose a job. You might lose a child. You succumb to rheumatoid arthritis or cancer or you lose your mind. If you live long enough, you get kicked in the teeth. And along the line, there will be moral temptations, physical challenges, relational challenges. How do you handle them? Number one. When you are struggling under trial, remember the Christian's goals. When you are struggling under trial, remember the Christian's goals. Verse 12. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because, having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. Now, in fact, verse 12 is picking up a theme that was already introduced back in verses 2 to 4 of the chapter. So we're going to look at those verses as well. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Did you hear that? Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Now, you read these two passages together, verses 2 to 4 and verse 12, and what you are given, in effect, are two reasons for facing trials, not only with equanimity, but with joy. First, because of the desirable goal of becoming mature. Consider it pure joy when you face trials because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And that's what a Christian wants to be. In other words, what is being done here is, is a goal is being held up for you. If you're a Christian, you don't want to simply have an escape ticket out of hell. You want to grow in conformity to Christ. 
You want to be strong. You want to be able to persevere. And one of the things that gives you perseverance is trials. In this fallen, broken world, what gives you perseverance is trials, plus the added grace of God to those trials that gives you perseverance. And when you had enough perseverance, you're finally becoming a little more mature. That's the first desirable goal that a Christian wants to maintain. And second, you get the crown of life at the end. Verse 12, blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. Now those who make profession of faith and fall away and crumble, maybe there's no gospel in them at all. But the one who perseveres under trial, well, that Christian is remembering the Christian's goals. And the ultimate goal is the crown of life. It's not a common expression in the Bible, but it does reoccur elsewhere. In Revelation 2.10, be faithful even to the point of death. Notice the emphasis on perseverance again. Be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. That is, the reward that is life. It's crowning life. It is not only eternal life, we receive that already, but eternal life and resurrection existence in the new heaven and the new earth. And so you press on toward that goal. In other words, the point here is when you are struggling under trial, remember the Christian's goals. If the Christian's goal is to get through with as few dangers or bouts of suffering or anxieties as you can possibly manage, if that's your cardinal goal, then every time you face any challenge, you become resentful. But if your goal is Christian maturity and resurrection existence, that changes everything. Some people are upset here over the reward language. Do this and you get that. The reward of this crowning life. Oh, there are so many things that could be said about that. But an illustration I've sometimes found helpful from C.S. Lewis, I'll pass on to you. He says, when you think about rewards, consider two men. One wants a woman. So he goes to the red light district of town and he pays his money and he has his reward. The other courts a young woman that he fancies, gets to know her really well, treats her with wonderful respect and affection and tenderness, treats her with purity and uh, genuine love, wants her good, gets to know the family, is trusted by the family. And in due course, there's a spectacular wedding. The two families come together and they're married and he has his reward. What's the difference? The difference, he says, is that in the first case, the payment is so incommensurate with the reward that the entire transaction is odious, vulgar, and obtuse. In the second case, the reward is nothing other than the consummation of a relationship. Christian rewards are finally bound up with being anchored in the grace of God and the gospel, which transforms us and sets us on a path where God in his mercy starts talking of reward, even though he knows full well that the only reason why we gain any of these rewards is because we're anchored in grace in the first place. It's merely the consummation of a relationship. That's why Romans can speak of rewards that are reckoned by grace. But there's some wonderful extra clauses in here we should think about. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, we read, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. You're identifying who these people are now. They're Christians, and, and, and Christians love this Lord Jesus. A friend of mine, Alec Matier, now retired, many years pastor, tells in one of his books of a, of a funeral he took. It was a funeral of an old woman. 
She and her husband had had about 60 odd years of marriage. Now she was finally gone. And as the widower stood by the tomb, he wept and said to my pastor friend, I suppose God must have, you, have more things for me to do elsewhere. Why would he have left me here? And my pastor friend said, my dear brother, God has nothing more for you to do except to love him still. You see, he was not saying there's nothing more to do. That's not the point. But your self-identity can't be bound up first and foremost with doing stuff. But still under trial, still under trial to love him still. This crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him, to love him still. So that you join the heritage of a Job who can still say, in the midst of it all, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Many, many moons ago, when I was an undergraduate at McGill University in Canada, studying chemistry and mathematics, of all things, <clears throat> There was a chap who came onto our campus to lead us in a Bible study uh, on the book of James. And in those days, after all, this is 1963, so it goes back a year or two. In those days, um, we all were reading the King James Version. And he was giving a series of expositions of James. So he came to James 2, which says in the King James Version, Count it all joy, my brethren, when ye fall into divers temptations. Some of us decided we'd better take this seriously. This is what the Word of God said. So four or five of us guys, we made a little covenant together. That every time we heard one of the others whining or complaining, we'd quote this verse at him. <laughs> so you can guess what happened. The next day, somebody came onto the campus complaining about a 10 o'clock calculus exam. And the other one would smirk and say, Count it all joy, my brethren, when ye fall into diverse temptations. And someone came on campus, you know, complaining about a, a dicey relationship with his girlfriend. My brother, count it all joy when ye fall into divers temptations. And of course, it didn't help. It was like rubbing salt into an open wound, you know. It, it was a, a game of sort of spiritual one-upmanship. Aha, gotcha, gotcha. But in God's mercy, after a while, it, it actually became the voice of God. We were beginning to listen. It caught on in the whole group. And you know what happened? Whining and complaints just disappeared. Not just because <laughs> everyone was afraid of a gotcha, but, but because of the goals that are set out for Christians. We want, don't we? We want the perseverance that leads to maturation. And we want to live with eternity's values in view. And the result was that of my four years at McGill, we saw more people converted to Christ that year than all, the other three altogether. Listen, when you are struggling under trial, remember the Christian's goals. Number two, when you confess God's sovereignty, do not misunderstand God's motives. When you confess God's sovereignty, do not misunderstand God's motives. Verses 13 to 15. Now the problem in understanding verse 13 is that the root behind Test and the root behind tempt is exactly the same in the original, which it means depends entirely on context. So, likewise, the word behind trial is the same as the word behind temptation. If I had to paraphrase verse 13, it would be something like this If you are tempted by such trials, do not say, God is tempting me. If you are tempted by such trials, do not say, God is tempting me. You see, James plunges from one to the other because he is writing as we experience these things. The same events that are opportunities to go forward are also temptations to become embittered and go backwards. Trial becomes temptation because it finds an answering chord within us. And what begins as a trial becomes now an occasion for bitterness and resentment and swearing at God and, and, and breaking up relationships and so on. Do you, do you see? 
So if you are tempted by such trials, do not say God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. The point is God does test people, but he doesn't tempt them. God tests people in the sense that he purposely, in his sovereignty, brings things together, situations and people where their willingness to obey him is frankly tested. The Bible says so. Genesis 22.1 explicitly says God tested Abraham when he gives him instructions to take him to Mount Moriah and to sacrifice him there. Or again, God tested Israel, Judges 2.22. Or again, God tested King Hezekiah, 2 Chronicles 32, 31. And so today, God certainly brings his people to various tests of one sort or another. But although God may do this to prove his servants' faith, or to lower their pride, or to foster endurance, he never does so to induce sin. That would be temptation. He never does so in order to destroy their faith. And the reason why he could not possibly be thought of as inducing sin, bringing us to temptation, as tempting us, is because, 13b, God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. You might well say, well, of course, the fact that God is tempted by evil, that's obvious, but what's that got to do with the argument? The argument is this. What you must understand is that temptation is an impulse to sin. And since God is not susceptible to any such impulse himself, how could you possibly imagine that he would be trying to give us some impulse to sin? What, what, what's in it for him, the one who is not tempted? Why should he be interested in, in inducing us to sin, for goodness sake? It's ridiculous to think that God has any motive in him that wants us to sin. He does not tempt anyone, the text says. No, no, no. A true account of temptation under God's sovereignty is then given in verses 14 and 15. Each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Stop blaming God for your temptations. God may bring you to the test, but the temptation to Turn it to evil in some fashion or another. is all bound up with your own life and heart. And then after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. There are really two images together here that are intertwined. One is a kind of fishing image where, where you, you send out a lure or you send out a bait. And, 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 and you, you snap after it. The fish snaps after it. You're dragged away and enticed. And the other is a conception birth thing. It's, it's bizarre. The mother is the desire. And she gives birth to the child, which is sin. And the sin, full grown, is death. Gives birth to death. Shocking language. To be full grown and stillborn. We understand how this works, of course. We flirt with sin feed our desire for something bad, then we act on it. We act on it enough times it becomes a habit. The habit stamps our character. When Charles Spurgeon, one of the greatest preachers of the 19th century, was expounding Psalm 1, he, uh, he made a point along the similar line. Psalm 1 describes the man who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers. Slowing down and grinding down from, from listening to bad advice to actually adopting a lifestyle to becoming a sneering, condescending mocker. At this point, Spurgeon says, a man receives his masters in worthlessness and his doctorate in damnation. There are all kinds of mysteries bound up with the confession of God's absolutely sweeping sovereignty. Nothing finally escapes the outer bounds of his sovereignty. That is why he can be trusted. But in scripture, that is always held in a certain kind of dynamic tension with the truth that human beings are responsible people too. 
Human accountability, human responsibility does not jeopardize God's sovereignty. And God's sovereignty is not threatened by human accountability. I wish I had time to probe that more with you. But those are givens in Scripture. They're just givens. And here it's spelled out explicitly. When you are tempted, do not question God's motives. When you are challenged by trials, do not misunderstand God's motives. When you confess his sovereignty, do not use that as a way of excusing your own moral accountability before God. Number three. When you feel abandoned and crushed, do not forget God's goodness. Verses 16 to 18. Verse 16 is really transitional. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. That is, do not allow yourself to wallow in rebellious self-pity or in an accusing stance. Don't kid yourself. Be honest about things. Don't be deceived. Don't be duped. Don't you understand? Here's the point, verse 17. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. Now, I'm standing at this lectern. There are spotlights on me from up here. There are more spotlights from back there. And the result is that as I look around, there are shadows just about everywhere. There's a shadow of my head down there and another shadow of my head over there. I hold up my hand here, and my hand has a shadow running in this direction, has a shadow running in this direction, has another shadow running in this direction. These spotlights all all throw shadows of one sort or another. Do do, do you know? It's just impossible in the physical world to avoid that. So we have the sun, and and we get a lot of, uh, of light during the daytime from the sun. And at night, we don't get anything directly from the sun. But on the other hand, some of it bounces off the moon and we we get some light that way. But but there are shadows. It's just just inevitable. We we, we can't think in any other term. And if we think light is good, well, then the shadows are bad. But we have a God who is all light. That's what the text says. It's a remarkable image. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. In the physical world, things do change. And where the light is coming from, what direction, where the shadows are cast, that changes. But we're dealing with a God who is all light. He's good. He's good, 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 good. He's not bad. He's never been bad. He never does anything bad. He's only good. His good is unqualified. Oh, he sovereignly and mysteriously and providentially rules over a a decaying, rebellious world where there is an awful lot that is bad. Of course, the Bible talks about God's sovereignty in these areas in many, many ways. But, But still, he himself remains unqualifiedly good. He cannot ever be anything other than good. In that sense, you see, he's very different from the force in Star Wars. <laughs> in Star Wars, there's this force, but, but whether it's the good side of the force or the bad side of the force basically depends on me and whether I use the good side or the bad side. But this God is, is good, 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 good. He's all surrounding good. He's good from any direction. There are no shadows. He's just good. So that part of Christian confidence in God in the midst of trials, even in trials that are hellish, is to recognize that in the mystery of providence, God still remains good. And you trust him. And I know that can be so hard when you're surrounded by alligators in a swamp. But you know the final proof That God is good? The text tells us. Verse 18. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth. That we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. Now what is this birth? Some have thought this birth is a natural birth. He brought us to existence. He gave us life. So we owe him everything because we have life. That is a true statement, but it's not the point here. 
No, he gave us birth through the word of truth. What does that mean? Now, that expression, the word of truth, is found only five times in the New Testament. And in every case, it means the same thing. The most explicit case is found in Ephesians 1.13. There we read, And you also were included in Christ where, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In other words, the word of truth in the New Testament is precisely the gospel. So read this again. He chose to give us birth through the gospel that we might be a kind of first fruits of all that he created. In other words, he chose to give us what we would call new birth. He chose to regenerate us through the gospel. The final evidence that God is good is, in fact, the gospel. The gospel of Jesus on the cross. The gospel of Jesus resurrected. The gospel of God by which, through Christ, he goes after a rebellious, sinful people and constitutes a new humanity by the means of what his own son has done on our behalf. We receive his righteousness. He receives our guilt and cancels it. He expiates it and turns aside his, his father's wrath. He propitiates his own father by God's own plan and design. And he, he not only gives us his Holy Spirit now as a down payment of the promised inheritance, but ultimately he gives us resurrection existence and absolute utter perfection and, and, and glory still to come in a new heaven and a new earth, a home of righteousness. All of this comes about through the gospel. He chose to give us this. He didn't have to. It, it wasn't that we earned it or he was just having a soft side that day. He, he, he chooses to do this out of the counsel of his own perfect will. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all, of he, the, of all that he created. And as Paul argues in Romans, he who did not spare his own son but freely gave him up for us all, how shall he not also with him freely give us all things? That's the argument. So that even when you cannot see what God is doing and the pain is pretty awful and the dislocation hurtful and you feel lonely almost to the point of despair and the temptations are ganging up on you and you want to give in, don't doubt God's goodness. Because the final proof of God's goodness is the gospel. Lay hold of the gospel. Go back to the cross. Think in terms of eternity. Meditate much on the character of God as displayed in the gospel. Did you see? It's the gospel that transforms you. And lastly, when you hear gospel instruction, do not merely listen to it. When you hear gospel instruction, do not merely listen to it. Verses 19 to 25. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Now, the first question to ask is, what is this word? Sometimes I think we read verses 19 to 25 and cut them off from the rest of the chapter so that we don't see the flow, we don't feel the power of the argument. So the word merely is that now which uh, tells you right from wrong and it, it tells you you're, you're, you're two-faced and you're, you're a bit of a liar. It, it, it's, it's the law in, in, in some sense. It, that's what the word is. And so you look at, in, in, in the mirror of the word of God and the word of God tells you you're a bit two-faced and you're a bit arrogant and you're not very good and, and you, you, you really can be prayerless and a bit cold-hearted and you don't love God with heart and soul and mind and strength and your neighbor is yourself. And, and, and this word comes to you and tells you who you really are and then you turn away from the mirror and just forget who you are. I'm not really all that bad, you know. I mean, compared with some people in the church that I know, I'm really not bad. <laughs> now, there's some truth that that's what we do, all right, but I don't think that's what this passage is about at all. Because 
We have just come through a very tight argument that introduces us to the word of truth, which is, in the New Testament, the gospel. That's what it is. And then the same expression, word, is picked up in verse 21 and in verse 22. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted, the gospel that's been planted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the gospel and so deceive yourselves. But you say, no, wait, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. You say, accept the word planted in you. If this is apparently being written to Christians, the word planted in you, this gospel planted in you, which can save you? I thought you already were saved. I thought that's what the gospel does. In this case, I thought it's what the gospel did. So how can it speak of the gospel saving us now? But I think that's the whole point. The gospel comes along and is very holistic. Th th those of us from the Reformed tradition rightly prize and cherish the importance of justification. Justification is that act of God by which God declares sinners to be just, not on the basis of their own qualifications, they're not just, they're sinners, but on the basis of Christ's justice. Christ's righteousness becomes ours. Our guilt becomes his. And he atones for it. He pays for it. He, he expiates it. He cancels it. God declares us just, not on the basis of our being just, but on the basis of what Christ has done on the cross. And we, we glory in that. And that is a huge part of salvation, but it's not the only part of salvation. That addresses the question of our guilt. It addresses the challenge of how we need to be reconciled back to God. We can't be reconciled back to God unless our guilt is dealt with. But by itself, that doesn't handle the question of the power we need to break the bands of canceled sin. The power we need to overcome sin. That, that, that is borne along by the Spirit of God. We are regenerated. We are transformed. We are born again. The gospel, in other words, not only cancels sin in the forensic dimension, it also empowers us and transforms us so that in the experience of life, we actually do change direction and love holiness in a way that we never did before. But then there are also relational dimensions. So much of our sin is bound up with bad relationships with God in the first place, but also with one another. And so we are saved, actually, to belong to this community called the church. We are incorporated into the church where we are to love one another as, as Christ also loved us. And the salvation is not only for this world in some piecemeal sort of thing. This, this salvation is ultimately to perfect health, resurrection, existence, transform life around the throne forever and ever and ever. It's, it's got an eschatological dimension. It's bound up with the end. This gospel is utterly transforming. So that at various points in the history of the church, we've tended to stress one dimension or another dimension. At the time of the Reformation, we very much stressed the forensic dimension, and we, and we spoke of justification. At the time of the great evangelical awakening, as it's called in Britain, the evangelical awakening in America, it's called the, the great awakening. At the time of Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield and the Wesley brothers in Britain and so forth, one of the great, great themes of the preaching of George Whitfield, who crossed the Atlantic 13 times, always by, by sail, and preached and preached and preached evangelistically in town after town after town, one of his great themes was, you must be born again. You must be born again. He preached on the necessity of the new birth more than he preached on justification. And when he was asked on one occasion, toward the end of his life, after he had preached on John 3, something like 3,000 times, he was asked, why do you keep on preaching again and again and again? You must be born again. You must be born again. Preach in another town. You must be born again. You must be born again. And then you go to another town. You preach again. You must be born again. You must be born again. Why? He says, because you must be born again. <laughs> 
And, and that too is bound up with salvation. Do you, do, 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 do you see? There, there is a possibility of, of sort of being doctrinally aware of forensic substitution and all the rest and, and still not see that you must be born again. But this gospel, this word of truth, comes to us and is able to save us. That is, not merely see that we are transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear son, though that is saving us. Not merely pay for our sin, though that is saving us. Not merely declaring us just before God, though that is saving us. But, but, but saving us from our ongoing sins, our ongoing temptations, our, on, our ongoing weaknesses. We're still not perfected. But this gospel still comes to us and in all of its dimensions. It saves us. It's able to save us. That's what it does. This gospel continues and works in us, saving us in, in, in every dimension until finally on the last day we're saved completely and totally. And we call that glorification. Salvation is a big category in the New Testament. And what drives it and empowers it is the gospel. What the New Testament writers on five occasions call the word of truth. So now read these verses again. Understanding the flow from the preceding. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Probably still understood in the context of trials and temptations. It's when we're facing trials and temptations, we're most likely tempted to blow up, speak intemperately, become angry, embittered, no longer listening to anyone. Forgetting that human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you, the word that you've already received, the word that is yours, this gospel truth that has already transformed you, that has already saved you. And th th accept this word, which can save you now in the midst of your trials and temptations, don't you see? The argument is continuing. You humbly accept this gospel truth, this full-orbed, comprehensive gospel reality, and you look to the God who is good, who's proved his goodness supremely in the giving of his own dear son. You accept this gospel truth and recognize that in his sovereignty he can yet be trusted. And there are Christian goals, goals that only Christians can understand, the desire to be mature, to live with heaven's glory still in view, the crown of life that awaits those who love him. And you press on. Accepting the word of truth which is able to save you. And what that means, of course, is that you don't merely listen to the word. You don't just hear another gospel sermon and think to yourself, oh, that's all for all the, all the blokes here are not yet converted. I can tune out on this one. Think about football. No, don't merely listen to the word. You're kidding yourself. There is a sense, of course, in which you're, if, a, if you're a Christian, you're, you're saved. I, I, I know that. Your standing with God is established. But there is a sense in which, if you're a Christian, you still need to be saved. Don't kid yourself. Oh, I know your standing before God is already secured. I know. I'm not, I'm not trying to jeopardize your salvation here. Don't, don't misunderstand. But don't deceive yourself either. Do what the gospel says. Do what the word says. Because the gospel holds up what we really are, what we really need, what God's answers are. It holds up everything before us. And we're driven back to the cross again and again and again and again. That's what Christians do when they hear the word of truth. They, they, they are driven back to, 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 to the gospel. Whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom. That's another of James' ways of referring to the gospel. And continues in it. Not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it. They will be blessed in what they do. So what's the difference between my two Englishmen? Which of the two Englishmen would you like to be like?
When you are struggling under trial, remember the Christian's goals. When you confess God's sovereignty, do not misunderstand God's motives. When you feel abandoned and crushed, do not forget God's goodness. And when you hear gospel instruction, do not merely listen to it. Do it. Let us pray. Eternal, wise, good, heavenly Father. We bow before you and confess how frequently we have been ready to follow the advice of Job's wife and curse God and die. But we bow afresh before you this morning. You know our lives through and through. You know what burdens and temptations each of us is carrying. We thank you for the demonstration of your love in so many avenues and venues across the pages of your most holy word and supremely in the gift of your son. This gospel word of truth by which we are saved, paid for by the blood of the master. So help us, we beg of you, to remember the Christian's goals not to impugn your motives, but to trust your goodness and to return again and again and again to the cross. We beg of you these mercies for Jesus' sake. Amen.